everybody, everybody, man, I got a smooth dude on the channel today. Strong inspirations where we give it to you straight, no chasing. Uh, this guy right here, um, I like him a lot, right? He, uh, he, and when I call him, he say, man, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. Uh, and I don't know how we met, but we've been like kind of cool. He is, uh, he in my movies. I, I think he in both of them. Matter of fact, <laughs> I got two documentaries out, my friends, if you know. And uh, one of them is about our hometown or well, my hometown, Detroit, called The Great Detroit. He's in that movie. And then he's also in my second movie that I talk a lot about that you all, if you've been following me, you know about Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. And, uh, oh, 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 you know, I'm just Anthony Brogdon. I say just Anthony Brogdon because I'm really not the star of the show. It's the people who are the guests because I let them do the talking. I just come up with a few questions and I'm happy that they uh, agree to come on the channel. Uh, and so, you know what I want you to do and, and just do it as soon as uh, the, the video is over, hit the subscribe button. Let me know that you're out there and you're following me and you kind of support my efforts. It's free, so there's no cost to you, but it's just something that I, you know, it helps me know my numbers. Hit the like on this video because you're going to like what this brother has got to tell you. I'm telling you, I like it so much in both of my movies. Hit the notifications bell so that when I put up a new video and I'm doing four or five of them a week, uh, you get a little ding that says, hey, there's a new video on Strong Inspirations. It's time to watch it and tell somebody about us, right? Tell somebody. Share this information. Don't keep it to yourself, my brothers and sisters. If any way possible, watch these videos with other people. And then, you know, on my own personal tip, this is the movie that I was talking about that our guest is in. It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. And he's going to talk a little bit about what, you know, he talked about in the movie, but I'm going to get him on another angle that he don't know about. Watch, and he's going to love it. <laughs> uh, but if we talk about Motown, and that's what he's going to talk about, uh, and how it, it, it's a little bit of the history of Motown in my film. And uh, it's streaming on Amazon. So just go to Amazon and plug in business mm -hmm. in the black and you get a chance to watch it uh, in your home and uh, on your laptop and on your cell phone. And then because my movie did so well, I wrote a book on it and it's titled Black Business Book. And uh, it has over 200 facts on black business, but it talks about slavery and what them racists did to destroy black business districts. Um, and you know, the height of what's going on now, the 100th anniversary of Tulsa, it talks about that. The last fact in my book is about Motown. I love me some Motown. And what happened is the book stops at 1960 and Motown is 59. That's when they started. He gonna give you more information on it. So that's why it's the last fact. Plus they were just, a, huge corporation, uh, very significant and still is in, in, in lives of not just uh, of us black people, but just people in general across the world. And that's Motown sound. So also get you a copy of my book. Come on now. And I'll autograph it. It's also available on Amazon, but you can also go to my website, which is businessintheblack.net. So come on, my friends, do that. Uh, you might hear me talk about the word strong. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And so uh, I, that's my lead in on my guest. It's a strong brother. And I, oh man, I, every time I, I'm telling you, let, I, I'm going to stop talking right there. Uh, come on and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for that intro, Anthony. Uh, I'm Billy. Wilson, the president of the Motown Alumni Association. Now, mm -hmm. now, how, how, I, I, well, I guess this is my, my, if this is a trick question, how you get to be the head of the Motown Alumni Association? When, when was it founded? And so on, give us a little background. Well, 
you know, my philosophy is you don't have to be somebody to be somebody. All you have to do is know how to put things together to make it relevant. So uh, it's kind of the same thing with you as a filmmaker. Sure. You know, you, you, you had a dream. That dream became a goal. Sure. That goal became a piece of a career. So how I started, it was in 1995. I was working with Martha Reeves. Uh, she had a community program and uh, for, the, for all of Detroit. Uh, basically, it was a kit. It, it was similar to karaoke. Okay, I got you. you. You know, you bring your tracks, they'll play your tracks, and you sing to your tracks. And, and But I was one of her directors. And when she, um, she had gone to the funeral uh, of uh, the Temptations bass singer, and, but when she came back, she was very sad over the fact that the only time she ever gets to see her comrades it, it is when somebody dies or something. I got you. Yeah, we know how that goes. Yeah. Series happens. So I came up with the idea. I said, well, why don't you put together an alumni association? Okay. She said, where did you come up with that cockamamie idea? I said, well, it can't be too cockamamie. White people do it. Yeah, they do, right, right. Black people do it in colleges yeah. and that type of thing. Now, 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 let me ask you this. Were, were you ever in the music industry yourself? Yes. I, I've been in the music industry as a performing musician for 50 really? For over 50 years. Were you a part of the Motown family? No. Okay. Was, uh, the closest, the first time I had been involved with Motown was with uh, David Ruffin. Okay. Every, every now and then he called me out to play bass at a gig here in Detroit somewhere. I see, I see. And and, uh, and him and I were very very good friends. Okay. We go to the hot dog, this one particular hot dog shop here in Detroit. I got you. And we we'd always just sit and talk. You know, and because I wasn't from Detroit, he didn't mind talking to me because I wasn't going to tell anybody. But, I see. You now, know. now you uh, you have a Facebook group, uh, the Motown. You got what, like fifty thousand members well, of your Facebook group or something? At one point in time, I had uh, like ninety thousand people, but uh, I whittled that down to about about fourteen or fifteen thousand dedicated people. Now, is I uh, does does the Motown People recognize your alumni association in some regard. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. See, originally when I first started, they didn't. You know, they were like Billy. Who was he ever a part of Motown? Right. You know, they were asking those kind of questions. But yeah, now, I'm sure. as years have gone by and many things that we've done, uh, yeah. Pretty much everybody recognizes. Uh, Let me ask you this: Is does is Barry Gordy? Does he ever post anything? Does he send you stuff to talk in your alumni association? Any of no, that kind of thing? I don't. Barry doesn't get online that I know of. But but now his daughter Sherry, we've been communicating for quite a few years now. Oh, I got you. And she's probably the closest to him currently of all his kids. I got you. And I, I got you. you know, she's really, she's really inspirational. I got you. Now, now, 
you, uh, as you were able to share in my movies, you know a lot of history of Motown. How, how did you learn the history, not being a part of Motown? Well, you know, now, particularly even more so now, I've gotten to know thousands of Motowners. And uh, some of the major people that were there during the beginning years, I've got, I had gotten to know them too. Okay. So everybody that, most people that were around Barry Gordy, I got to know them in one way or the other. I see. Okay. Now, uh, in short, how did Motown get started? Um, it was basically a dream that Barry Gordy developed, but he, I don't think he really wanted a record company originally. He was a songwriter. Right. And, and he wrote, him and his sister and Billy Davis, they wrote for um, G Jackie Wilson. You know, Reek Petit and Lonely Teardrops and those kind of songs. Uh, most of Jackie's big songs were written by Barry Gordy. Now, let me ask you this. What record label was that that, that, that Jackie Wilson was on there? That was, uh, um, I think, Buddha. Okay, or Buddha. Brunswick. Okay. Bruns I think it was Brunswick. I got you. Yeah. So then he wrote the songs, and then what happened? He wasn't getting paid that much. <laughs> you know, his, uh, uh, Smokey Robinson went to him and said, look. This is after they opened up the, the royalties check, you know, letter. Yeah. And Smokey said, man, you might as well start your own company if, uh, if, if this is all you're going to make. I got you. Uh, you know, it was like $3 or something like that for all of those big hits. And, and very... Uh, um, Bada boom, bada bing, he started Tamil Records. Let me ask you this, how old was Barry at the time? Good question. He had, he had to be in his 20s, early 20s. Early 20s, okay. Actually, he might have been in his mid-20s. I got you. Because everybody else was young, younger than him. The only per you know, the only people that were close to his age were like Smokey and, and Barrett Strong and some of those other people. I got you. So now he decides to uh, start a record company. Does, where does he get the funding? I mean, does he have some money himself? His family, his, his family had the, I think it was called the Ray Bear Fund. Uh, family fund, and basically it was just used for emergencies. And but he went to the family and asked them for some money. And, and of course, he had people that were kind of against that. They 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 didn't see it as a opportunity, except some of his sisters, particularly Gwen. You know, she thought that, um, you know, she was a part of his writing team. So, of course, she's going to be on his side. But the, a couple of the other sisters, Anna and some of the others, uh, they were all for Barry, you know, to get that money. It was about $800. When, when you start a record company, uh, $800 was a long time. And what, what do you what do you do with the money initially? You, you have to get a building, you got to get a way to print the records. What do you what do you need the money for? You, at that time, the biggest uh, cost was actually making the 45s uh, uh, and recording. Those were the two biggest costs. I got you. And we had the recording equipment for him to record initially. He he went to other studios. 
you know, there were studios here in Detroit that um, that he went to, and a couple of them, and um, he he made his recordings there. Who 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 would you say was his uh, his very first artist? That was um, Marv Johnson. Um, Marv Johnson was one of his friends. And uh, it, the song was called Come to Me. Now, of course, it, it didn't make a big splash anywhere. But that was his first recording under Tamala Records. Okay. Uh, when we talk Motown, we have to talk about the sub labels, right? You know, so old Gordy, you know, uh, Motown. Everything was a sub label to Tamala Records because Tamala was the very first record company. Okay. He started and, and he never let it go. But he had other labels that were involved, which Motown was one of those other labels. And 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 why would he do that? Because the other labels did a different style of music or well, how do you think that was? The, uh, I I talked to Barney Ailes, who was his marketing director, and Barney said when they were coming up, Motown started, eventually started doing so well that he didn't want Motown to have a monopoly on the music business as a whole. You know, if everything started coming out on Motown, Motown has the first hit, second hit, third hit, fourth hit, fifth hit. That, that's a problem. And that would have been a problem for white people too. I got you. Yeah, so they had multiple labels that were, you know, some of them had predominantly white artists uh, people like Pat Boone, he was under the Hitsville record label. Oh. You know, he had multiple artists doing different things. So, okay, so let's say Motown starts out, and uh, when was it, do you know the year his first record was released under Tamala? Uh, uh, 59. Okay, so 59. The Come and, To Me album, the Come To Me 45. All right. And then after that hit, then what, what was the next hit? Who did he sign next after that guy? Well, there were multiple people signed. Mabel John, she was she was one of the first solo artists. Um, but uh, Barrett Strong probably had to be the, the first local hit that he had. And that was the song Money. And uh, um, he, he, the, the first group he had uh, were the Miracles. And they at that time, they were called the Matadors. OK. And he, um, I think, he had a, they had a song called Get a Job. Okay. And, and he uh, had that song put under uh, a record label called the End Record. End Records. Okay. So, you know, it done well. So, uh, who did, who, who, when, okay, you print a record, now you got to sell it. How did he get it to be sold? And in the, at that time, I'm sure there was record stores. How did he get it out of his basement to the record stores, to the radio, to get radio play? How, how tricky was that? 
eventually he got this guy, his name was Barney Ailes. And Barney, he worked for a record distribution place. Okay. Already. He was already a professional. And Barry convinced Barney to eventually come over to his label. Okay. And Barney apparently at first I, I, Barney said he didn't really care to join a black label. Yeah, so Barney's a white guy. Yeah. Yeah, Italian guy. Okay. And, and so but Barney liked Barry because Barry was a good listener. So so Barry is is really making these moves in his 20s. So Barry is a smart guy to know what moves to make. He knows I got to come up with somebody. I got to go out here and meet somebody to help me distribute these records. And then he meets this Italian guy and he talks him into helping him do the records. Yes, and then um, he, he started hiring other people to be a part of his dream. These were all people that were from different parts of the city. Uh, um, many of them had their own skills. Some of them didn't have a whole lot of skills, but they had some sense. You know, they were not uh, the greatest professionals. I got you. Uh, in, in the very beginning, much of the music uh, were done by jazz musicians that Mickey Stevenson found. I got you. And uh, the producers, they weren't professional, you know, producers that, or arrangers that could uh, give charts or anything like that. I got you. So the producers had to go to the musicians and say, I want this, boom, 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 boom. And the musicians had to pick it up. I got you. And create the music. So in the beginning, the musicians actually created the music based on what the producers might have said coming out of their mouths. Now, now in the early days, where was Barry doing this? In his basement at a at, in a house? Or did he, as soon as he got enough money, get an office? How did where did he, you know, where were the first meetings held? Well, uh, eventually they were held at uh, where the Motown Museum is on Grand River here in Detroit. Where, that's where the home of Motown is now. But he started building his arsenal really at that place, at Hitsville. And he was really, uh, he, you know, you have to be dedicated to do such a thing, to, to go out, to step out there, particularly in the 60s, the late 50s and early 60s, prejudice was strong. I can't imagine. You know, uh, I remember in the la later years, um, this is even before I started the Motown Alumni Association, I remember the musicians and the artists, they were dogging out Barry. And I was with them at the time. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever you said, that must be right. Well, once I started the organization, I started studying what Barry was doing and how he did it at the time that he done it. Right. I thought, wow, that was some phenomenal leadership. Yeah. Um, 
What is 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 Motown the first black record company like of its type? No. Well, of its type, yes. But what I mean, of its type. Whatever. What is, you said no, and then you said yes. What do you well, mean by that? VJ Records and there were uh, Savoy, I think. One of one or both of those were. They had black executives. Uh, the predominant of record companies were predominantly white. Sure. So um, they were really stepping out there. You know, they, I, I'm not sure that Barry really pondered over how big it was for him to do that. I got you. You know, but since he was already with uh, Jackie Wilson, and he's seen that Jackie Wilson was uh, really becoming a great artist. Uh, at his time, he was a great artist. Jackie Wilson was a great artist. Sure, sure. So, and he was a part of that group of people. So. I guess he felt, okay, if he could do it, I could do it too. I got you. Now, 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 Jack, now, Jackie Wilson was in Detroit at the time, right? When he was writing the songs for him. Yes. But Jackie Wilson is not from Detroit. No, he's from Detroit. Oh, Jackie Wilson is from Detroit. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Yep. Now, uh, so Barry, uh, he gets... What what was if you could say what was his first mega hit? His first big hit was uh, um, Smokey Robinson's. Um, I think it was "Tracks of My Tears." Okay. No, ooh, I think it was "Ooh Baby Baby." It was one of those songs, but okay, it was a Smokey Robinson hit. That was his first hit. And that was his first million seller hit. But eventually the Marvelettes followed behind them and that was their first hit on the pop charts. Oh. On the pop and R&B charts. So when, as Barry is the president of this, Barry, is Barry writing the songs too, or does I mean, is he writing the songs? He, is he, is he going songs. out looking for the artists? Uh, all those different functions, I'm sure initially, and then well, at some point he hires people to do that work, right? He didn't. He 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 didn't do all of that stuff. Mickey, he had he eventually had a staff. Mickey Stevenson. And, um, Barrett Strong, um, uh, Barney Ellis, I mean, uh, Al Abrams. Yeah, I got you. You know, they were all a part of his infrastructure that he built, and his ex wife, Ray Noma, because Ray Noma was, was the manager of the company. Uh, they started their publishing company, uh, Ray Bear, the Ray Bear Company. And it was a mix, it, it, the name was a mixture between Ray Noma and Barry Gordy. So I got you. Ray Bear. And, and the, um, they got people together to be background vocalists. The first background vocalists were the Ray Bear singers. Almost everybody that was in that group had something to do with the intricate portion of Motown Records. I got you. So now Motown uh, explodes onto the scene. Barry now has, uh, what, 30 people working for him? Um, in the very beginning, I'd say about maybe, Ten. Okay. Maybe ten. 
And, but of course, things grew as they had gone along. They had to, the, the most important thing is they had to fool white people and white radio personalities, distributors, so that they can get their records sold. Right. Because they called them race records then. Those were called race records. And the only thing worse than race records at the time was hillbilly records. So, you know, they, they hardly ever played hillbilly records. Sure. And they would play race records and then when they get through playing them, they'll go, well, we'll never play this again. Bam. And then you can hear them breaking the record really? on the radio. Well, so, now, so the records, when you you you, you kind of alluded to this, the first records were 45s. All, almost throughout the 60s. And then from 45, wasn't there something called 33? Yeah, those were albums. And then there's a there's 45 and 33 albums. Uh, yeah. Wasn't there something in between there that was smaller than an album? Or an album, did yeah. an album had so many, an album had like 10 songs on it? Yes. A 45 only had two songs on it. Yes. And, and, and Motown predominantly in the beginning, they just sold 45. Now, as they gradually went along, they eventually started selling albums, but they couldn't put black faces on the albums. They didn't put black faces on albums because that way the, the white radio people, they, would, they, they couldn't identify if the people singing on it was black or not. I got you. But what, why that, that was important was because of prejudice. Yeah, sure, sure. But what buried them did, they examined the nation and what the nation was listening to. They use this thing called the formula. The formula is how white people respond to things. For example, um, when you clap, you know, when we watch white people on television, white people do this. Yeah. That's how they clap. Black people, we clap on the beat. One, two, one, two. White I got people. you. I got you. Now, if you make more to make more money, you got to get white people to buy stuff. Cause black people wasn't they didn't have the money to buy a lot of stuff, but white people. I got you. I so, got you. So what Motown did the formula is they added components to their music that white people like. So if you if you go with this concept, Jimmy, Jimmy, oh Jimmy man, I love it, I love it. Come see about me, and uh, the people, uh, uh baby, baby, let it down the go. Uh, you got know, you. they use that component in in a lot of their music. I got you, and. They also use the Indian, we call it the Indian beat, the Indian warrior beat. If you listen to, I heard it to the grapevine. Doom, 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 doom. Back in the day. I got you. That means in the in cowboy and Indian movies, that means the Indians were around. If you heard that beat, doom, 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 yes, doom, yes, doom, yes, right. Well, that's the same beat that's in, I heard it through the grapevine. 
And, I got you. And Gladys Knight used it. And so did Marvin Gaye. They used that same beat. Doom, 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 doom. Ooh. Yeah, that's right. I can hear it. I can hear it. You see? That's called the formula. Wow. And so why now- and white people got duped. <laughs> they got duped in it. And so um, he's got the record companies. I mean, the, the, the radio stations wanted to play the records. Um, and 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 at one point, uh, if you can, uh, if you got an idea, how many artists, let's say in the '60s or the '70s, did he have under 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 contract? Well. The 60s and 70s were like two totally different eras. Yeah. But maybe 10, 11, maybe even more. You know, keep in mind, if you remember the Motown review, he had a number of artists there. Right. You know, what, about seven or eight? Oh, okay. Ish, just, just on that review. That, that doesn't include the artists that were before, you know, that that were at home and wasn't able to get on the review. Right. Uh, um, Willie Tyler and Lester, the ventriloquist. Right. He was on that review. You know, he he went on many of those Motown reviews. Ah, I see. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was he was a Motowner too. Now, as we kind of come to a close, um, how how large did Motown end up getting uh, financially, successfully? On the, were they trading on the the stock exchange? Uh, no, it was always privately owned. That kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, it was always privately owned. They they made millions and millions of dollars throughout the decades. Um, but by the time he sold the company in the 80s, he was losing money. And after the Jackson 5, he really quit working hand in hand with artists. He depended on a lot of his staff to um, to handle a lot of the artists, Rick James, Tina Marie, the Mary Jane girls, you okay. know, Commodores. He, he really quit actually being a part of their infrastructure. Oh, man. I, I, I got one, and I know everybody want me to ask you, how did he discover the Jackson 5? Bobby Taylor brought the group to Motown, but Gladys Knight actually first seen them. And she tried her best to contact Motown to talk about this group that they seen in Chicago. And, but Bobby Taylor eventually got their attention because Bobby was a producer also. See, Gladys, she was just an artist. Right. But Bobby was a producer. And he had his group, Bobby Taylor, you know, in the Vancouver. And so Bobby actually brought them to Motown and uh, um, Susan DePass, she pushed that that key to have Barry to look at them. And and the the Jacksons were quite professional at that time. I got you. What what about Stevie Wonder? How do you think he got got with Stevie Wonder? He was brought in by um, by, uh, Rotten White of the Miracles. He, they, he found him and, uh, you know, they just led him on in. Yeah. I don't think Barry necessarily wanted him the first time, but the little boy was so talented. 
Yeah. You know, he could play drums, he could play bongos. You know, he was quite a talented young man. Yeah. So. And for a long period of time, for after fingertips, because fingertips was a huge hit. And Stevie didn't have any hits after you know after that for a little bit. Oh, I got you. But fingertips was so huge that he kept them around. And eventually he let the women handle his um, production. He had, he had women producers, Sylvia Moy. I got you. And from that time on, from that time on, he just took off. I got you. Well, hey, everybody, we got to stop somewhere because I know he could keep going. You're talking about years and years, and there's so many layers to the Motown family and so on and so forth. But I did want to give you all my viewers just something as to how this black man at the age of 20 was astute enough first to make the decision to do it and then to do the things and put the pieces together that grew into the phenomenon that is Motown and still is Motown. A yeah. uh, 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 brother, is there, uh, uh, with your alumni association, do you all have any events or anything? You just kind of treat, keep the people together and let them, the Motown family talk among themselves and that kind of thing? Well, originally that's what I started out doing and that's all I wanted to do. And it start, it's still only an internet organization. Yeah. And we're getting ready to do a, a park called Unity Park. And it's gonna have it's gonna be an all red brick park. And it's gonna the Motown Walk of Fame is gonna be in that park. Man, brother, this has become your calling in your life. And it's so great that you have uh heed the calling to do yeah. and to give your life all these years. You talking about, you've been doing this uh, probably, what, 40 years or more, right? Well, no, I, I started in 90, 95. Okay, so 95. Yeah, yeah that's 20, that's 20 yeah. years at least. Yeah. Man, so, I love you for doing it. Everybody, this is what I do with strong inspirations, man. You telling me, man? I give it to you straight, don't chase. I just trying to find the people who know the stories, truthfully know the stories. And this is just one of those gentlemen. Uh, everybody, like I say, he's in my movie, uh, Business in the Black. He's in the other one, The Great Detroit. I thank you for being a guest on the show. Uh, I say to you, uh, with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong stay safe, stay on your grind. We love it that you're keeping that Motown name in your own way alive and the light shining bright. Uh, I, I thank you again for being on the channel and everybody, I thank you. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button on this video, hit the notifications bell, tell somebody about Strong Inspirations, share this video among your friends uh, check out his alumni association. And I don't know if he's going to let you join or what have you, but at least look and see what he's doing and stay in touch. Uh, that I'm going to do also. Uh, with that, I'm going to say bye-bye. We out.